other list, but not necessarily in the same order. Um, and we will deploy that for um, our container like structures. So, when can you take the pieces out of one container and reassemble them to make the pieces of another in such a way that you use? all of the pieces uh, exactly once. So that's to say, <laughs> we'll effectively have um, uh, the doings for making jigsaw puzzles. Because the pieces will have a perimeter or some index that they have to conform to. And you can only put a piece in a place where it fits. Um, so once we have that, uh, we will be able to do um, a, a proper theory of uh, cutting up space. Let me. Uh, uh, probably should have put both screens down because I could use a board at this stage. Um, right. Imagine you've got. Two tilings of the same rectangle, that's to say two layouts for the same screen. And some of them, some of the tiles in that layout are transparent, and each of the layouts are transparent. If you were to superimpose them, you would be able to see through the holes in the front layer to whatever stuff was behind in the back layer. And that means you need to be able to cut out from the back layer the things that are visible through the holes in the front layer. Yeah? And once we've got that, um, uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be able to build uh, window managers that don't just tile, but that actually behave like a typical desktop, where you have layers of a desktop that have maybe you know one rectangular window somewhere in the middle and then empty space surrounding it. And if you can superimpose layers like that, you're laughing. Uh, the trouble is uh, that. If you've got this front layer, back layer situation, uh, the back layer might not be cut up neatly in the same pattern as the front layer. In fact, you'd expect you'd expect it wouldn't be. So, uh, 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 the the question then is how to impose on the back layer the cutting up structure of the front layer. And that's where you get into, uh, never mind the pieces it's cut up into now, I want it to be cut up this way. Uh, so rearrange the pieces you've got into the pieces you want. And that's where permutations matter. Um, so uh, we'll figure out how to manage permutations, and then we'll figure out how to manage cutting up interiors right, in whatever way you want, rather than whatever way they are actually cut up. And at that point, uh, you will have control. So that's, that's what's going to go there. Um, but I should do some more stuff here. Um, uh, administratively, uh, this is my last lecture of this term. I know we have a slot on Friday. Unavoidably, I've had to put a first year test into that slot was the only time I could get the lab space. Um, and that
that leaves open the question of uh, what to do for you guys on Friday afternoon. And it seems to me that there are three options which are conditional on uh, the uh, availability of suitable people. Um, uh, option one, which is easy, is to do nothing. Um, uh, option two is to turn Friday's slot into a lab slot and line up uh, someone who knows what's going on uh, to, who isn't me to mind that lab. Uh, and the third option is actually related to the current subject matter that we're doing in lectures, uh, which is uh, to consider, so what we did last time here, we wrote, we built our typed language with functions and lists and one, and we wrote an interpreter for it, where um, if you feed in, as we did, we actually managed to define append and then append two lists. Uh, but the point is, if you feed in an environment that maps variables to values, then you can turn a term into a value. Um, but uh, you might want to do more than that one of these days. If somebody gives you uh, a term which contains uh, variables and you don't know the values of the variables, you should still be able to compute that term as much as possible. So if you see uh, a fold or applied to a cons, you ought to be able to take a computation step. Uh, so you get stuck in that process when you bump into a variable that you don't know the value of. So if you think about actually what the Agda type checker does, it evaluates expressions that have three variables in them uninterpreted variables, and it does as much evaluation as possible, uh, even though the variables are, you know, not mapped to concrete values. Uh, so there's still a notion of normal form, where you've taken a term and you've done as much computation as is possible, and got stuck eventually. Well, you might get all the way to a value, you might get stuck because there are variables in the way. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, how do we do? Um, how do we do uh, evaluation? How do we do normalization? How do we put a term into its normal form when it's got um, uh, free variables? same sort of thing happens if you have a function. If you have a lambda term, at the moment our interpreter just says, wait for the value of the argument for the function to turn up, and then evaluate the body of the lambda. But what if instead you want to do as much computation as possible under the lambda, even without knowing the value of the variable? That's, uh, uh, that's a fun thing to do. And our very own James Chapman is a particular expert in how to do that. So uh, uh, I asked him if he might be willing to show you how that's done, uh, starting from this language that we built last week. Um, and, uh, and he's still making his mind up, but I'll let you know. However, in the meantime, um, I, uh, I want to try to sort of set that up a little. Um, okay, um, 
So what I want to do, we've got a notion, we've got a notion of syntax. Here's our syntax, and it's got a notion of variable. Uh, so as well as just interpreting terms, we ought to be able to manipulate terms in various ways. And one of the things we ought to be able to do is to, uh, to substitute terms for variables. Right? If you've got a term that's got some variables in it, and you know uh, how, to, you know, and you've got a bunch of terms that you want to replace the variables with, you should be able to process terms systematically, replacing uh, the the variables with your chosen stuff. Um, but uh, that turns out to be uh, th th there's there's a little wrinkle that you have to work around. So first of all, we ought to figure out what a substitution is. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to perform a small refactoring of this code. So remember, we had an environment, and an environment maps variables to values. And what we said was, for each variable in scope, we need a value, and the value has to have the right type. OK? Um, so uh, that's all very well, but if we want to make a substitution, that's going to be a mapping of variables to terms, not to values. However, if the substitution is going to be sensible, the terms that we use had better have the right type, the same type as the variable. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense to substitute those terms for those variables. If it's not, if it doesn't respect the type, it's not. You're not going to get a sensible term out afterwards. Yeah, it's no point in taking a variable that stands for a list and substituting a function for it. That's daft. So we're going to have to figure out how to represent a substitution that could possibly make sense in the first place. And in order to do that, we've got a We've got a notion of mapping from uh, variables to typed values. We should generalize that to a mapping from variables to typed stuff. Uh, and you've seen something like this before. I'm going to generalize still further. Uh, if you've got, in this case, a backward list, or what we've been calling a context of things, and you know for each thing in the list what sort of stuff you want, then you can explain what it means to have appropriate stuff for all of the things in the list. Oh, what just happened there? Oh, that should be P of T. And I should probably change the capital T's to lowercase x's, just be tidy. Okay, does that make sense? So all we're saying is, uh, we've got some notion of P that uh, is indexed over x's, so stuff appropriate to a given x, and we've got a backward list of those, of x's, and we're just saying, we want a P for each thing in the list. So we just build a big tuple. We did this already with uh, when we were building containers. Okay, and then all I've said, I've restored the notion of an environment by saying the things that are appropriate to the list elements are going to be values, and that means 
of course, that the things in the list had better be types. So this definition is, is fine. I'll probably write its type down, but just for documentation purposes. Okay, and uh, what's more, uh, I can generalize select very slightly. I hope I get away with this. And I do. selection of the S's from the T's and we have P's for all the T's, then we definitely have P's for all the S's. Um, okay, so now I ought to be able to say what a substitution is. So what, what in general is going on is that we've got, suppose we have some terms that have some variables in them, and the variables live in scope S's. And we want to map those variables to terms which live in scope T's. How do we do it? What information do we need? Well, first of all, we're going to need a thing to map each variable to. So that means we'll have to have an all something s's. That should be in question mark, shouldn't it? We need, uh, uh, we need to map all the source variables to something. And uh, what are we going to, and you can see it's going to be something we are allowed to look at the type of the variable in order to say what would be an appropriate thing to map it to. Uh, so, okay, uh, I'll give myself a lambda, get rid of it later. So now S is the type of the variable that we're going to map. T's is uh, the variables that are in scope after the substitution. So we're going to need a term in scope T's of type S. And then, having seen that, I'm just going to get rid of the unnecessary lambda. Um, so that's a substitution. It says, uh, and it's a, a type safe substitution. We know that whenever, and it's a scope safe substitution. We know that whenever we bump into a variable, we will have the right information to replace that variable with a thing that has the right type and doesn't refer to any variables that aren't in scope. All right, so let's see if we can do it. Subst, uh, it's gonna say, uh, for all, we've got a source context, we've got a target context and we've got a subs from one to the other. Uh, under those circumstances, we ought to be able to take a term of any type in the source context and give back a term the same type in the target context. That's to say, if our substitution preserves the types of, if the actual operational variables preserves types, then the operation on the whole term ought to preserve types. So this is a lot like evaluation, except instead of, it's sort of symbolic evaluation. Instead of mapping variables to values, we're mapping variables to terms, but it's going to be very similar. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, that just as we were always respecting types when we did the evaluation, 
we're always respecting types when we do the substitution. So uh, let's just call that uh, T is equal to T. Oh, what have I done? Um, T Y. Uh, T Y. Okay. Right. So we've got a bunch of work to do, and uh, the uh, the business happens immediately. Um, we hit our variable. It is in scope. We know how to map all of the variables. So what we have to do is figure out what happens to that variable in particular. And it's going to look a lot like that. So much so that I'm just going to pinch it. just select, so remember a variable says how to choose one thing from a list, uh, so uh, when we do our select, um, we get back, um, when we select from our substitution, we get back a tuple that just has the one term in it, and you can see that the term has exactly the right type. That's to say, the term has the same type as the variable. Uh, the variable has type S, and it's in the right scope. So, hooray. We know how to act on a variable. Right. Then, uh, from here on in, it it ought to be, at least for a while, it will be straightforward, right? What does substitution do to things that uh, aren't variables? Well, it should just leave them alone and, and act recursively on their subcomponents, yeah? So we turn uh, 1 into 1, and we turn nil into nil. And... Uh, then here we can say subst t is t times subst t is t is. So push the substitution inside. <coughs> and then this is some cons thing, this is some nil thing, and this is some list. So we're going to turn that into fold r of something, something, something. And that's not guessing it for me. And I'll do the last one because you can guess where the problem is. <laughs> Everything's going swimmingly until we get to here. Actually, we could get a little bit further. Uh, when we go under a lambda, we know we're going to want to do a substitution to the body of the lambda. But now look. This thing here is really a substitution from S's to T's. But now that we've gone under a binder, under the lambda, there's an extra variable on the source side, the one that the lambda introduced. And because we said we were going to turn a lambda into a lambda, there's an extra variable on the target side. So uh, we've got a little problemette of uh, you know how to 
how to deal with that. Um, so, um, we can get some way with that. Uh, we can even say, well, we know that because there's something in the source context, we know we first of all have to explain how to map the new variable. Do you remember, I mean, a long time ago in the dim and distant past, you may have been taught the land calculus by Richard Connor. And there was a whole business about when you're doing a beta reduction and you have to do a substitution and it goes inside a lambda, you have to figure out how not to screw up the variable names. Does that ring a bell? Capture avoiding substitution? We are in the same, the same problem here. But we're going to get out of it just now. OK. So we've got to say, what do we map the lambda's variable to? Uh, well, since the subst our original substitution just refers to the variables outside the lambda, doesn't say anything should happen to the lambda's variable, then we better make sure that we map the lambda's variable to itself, or rather, we should map the lambda bound variable on the source side to the corresponding lambda bound variable on the target side. So we can do that if we have the right bits and pieces. We've got to give back, so we've got to give back a term of type S, but we have the lambda bound variable of type S in scope, so let's be having it say here var and now we have to choose which variable we want and I would like the top one please so I'd like to, to keep I give a selection which keeps the top one and then I believe I have already defined the thing that skips all the other ones so we've got as far as saying uh, map the new, the lambda bound variable from the source side to the lambda bound variable on the target side. So now we just have this little difficulty of saying, uh, you know, we've got um, uh, a bunch of image terms for our source, our old source variables in the old target context and our problem is that once we've gone under a lambda on the target side there's an extra variable in the target context but fortunately for us all of the variables we started from are still in scope so all we've got to do is fix up those variables We've got to make sure that instead of choosing variables just from t's, we're choosing them from t's and this extra one. But if we were able to choose the variables from these things, we ought to be able to choose them from those things and some more. Yeah? Um, so it's all going to be fine. We'll need, um, we'll need another gadget, which is, of course, functoriality of all. surprises here I hope what am I saying uh, if we always know how to turn a P into a Q and we've got P's for all of these X's 
we should be able to get Qs for all of the Xs, just by turning each of the Ps into a Q. You've done this before. I hope. Um, so what do we do? We look at the list. Uh, okay, everybody happy with that? Just go through doing the appropriate f. So it's not just, right, our, our function has to say, do the appropriate thing for the index x. Okay, so now we're in a position to make slightly more progress here. You can see that we've got a bunch of old image terms for the Source, old source context, we want a bunch of new image terms for the old source context. So we're going to do some all thing. And I'm hoping I'm going to get away with this, but I might not. Right. Oh, that's fine. I didn't have to bring that context into scope. And now it comes down to saying, what do we have to do for each thing? And you can see that what we have to do for each thing is, no matter what type it is, we need to take a term of that type in the old context and give back a term of the same type in a slightly bigger context. And we've got to do that just by tweaking all of the variables. OK. Um, so here's what happens. In general, uh, if we know that we have that T's is a bigger context than S's, that's to say, here we're saying S's embeds into T's. Everything that was in S's is in T's, and there's some extra stuff as well. Then we ought to be able to take terms over just the S's and turn them into terms over. Uh, all of the T's. And uh, let's uh, figure out, well let's first of all check that that's fit for purpose. I think I'm going to need to build some more kit here. In fact, I know I am. I'm going to need the identity thinning. that before. Okay, and now I should be able to solve this problem. Because what I'm going to say is, give me the type and now I need a function from terms to terms and that's going to be thinning by something. And now I just have to explain how the old context embeds in the new one. And you can see how the old context embeds in the new one. If I give it the hint of um, uh, that the identity substitution exists, you see it comes up with it. What does this say? This says immediately uh, to, uh, to get from the new context back to the old one, you throw away the top variable. <coughs> that we didn't want, and you keep all the other ones. Yeah? That's exactly what we needed. OK. Good news. The other thing we're going to need, we've got the identity. What else do you think we might possibly need? We're going to need composition.
remember that we look at the second one first, we move that one to the top, and then for this one we have to look at the other one. So what's going on? Uh, composition of two empty thinnings is the empty thinning. Uh, if either of the two thinnings throws the top variable away, then the top variable is being thrown away. If both thinnings keep the top variable, then we're keeping the top variable. Right? Not clear. So now, let's show that we can do thinning to terms. And let's go straight to business. What happens when we hit a variable? Well, a variable is a selection of one from S's and our thinning tells us that S's is smaller than T's. S's embeds in T's. So can we construct, can we show that it is possible to select this variable from the T's instead? Well, what do you know? Yes, we can. All we have to do is compose the two things. Okay. Now, the other piece of business is uh, the other case where we're likely to hit trouble is the lambda case. So let's just go straight there. That's where we had trouble before. Let's make sure we're not in trouble again. Right? What we want to do, we want to turn lambda into lambda, and we need to do some thinning of the body of the lambda. And now you can see what's going on before. We had a thinning that says the old source variables are embedded in the old target variables, but we've just gone under a lambda both on the source side and on the target side, so there's an extra variable on both sides now. So we have to explain how the new source variables embed in the new target variables. And that means we have to say, first of all, what to do with the top variable. Are we keeping it or are we throwing it away? Well, it's just possible that the, the lambda we're acting on actually uses its bound variable, so we'd probably better keep it, right? So we decide to keep it, and now what are we left with? Well, then it asks us, what are you doing with all the other variables? And we know what we're doing with all the other variables. Did you notice something, by the way? Um, look at this line. This tells you something about the relationship between the keep the top variable constructor of thinnings and respectively identity and substitution. If you read these equations from right to left instead of the way they're defined, you can see this says, what does os 
due to the identity, it gives you the identity. What does os do to a composition? It gives you os of the pieces composed. That's to say that uh, we don't uh, just have uh, any old nonsense. The action of, so what, we, what we've really got is a category whose uh, objects are the contexts and whose morphisms are the thinnings. And what we have here is a functor from that category to itself. The thing that says, extend the context with an extra variable. What does that do to contexts? It glues another element on the list. What does it do to thinnings? It uh, does this. So what we're really exploiting is the functorial structure of thinnings. And what we're really defining here, um, wherever it's got to, is uh, a functor. I mean, what do you think will happen if we do the identity thinning to a term? You know, what will we get back? You know, uh, yeah. Uh, so we really got a functor here from the category of thinnings to the category of uh, terms of a given type where the objects are the contexts. Uh, so the rest of this will hopefully be boilerplate. Um, Okay, uh, so we've managed to define thinning, and that completes our definition of substitution. <coughs> but um, if you're me, and you look at these programs, you get spectacular sense of, of boredom. Um, because look at those, look at thinning and substitution. They're almost exactly the same. And um, I don't know, um, uh, sometimes it's very tempting when you're, when you're told uh, write a program that's almost exactly the same as a program you've already written. You might feel kind of a sense of reassurance. Oh, thank goodness, I probably know how to do it. Um, but, uh, but when you're me, life's too short. I don't want to write the same program twice. Um, so. so, what's going to happen? But notice that subst is one of those things, and so 
is thinning. They are both some sort of relationship between source and target contexts. So, the question is, uh, how do we um, explain, if we've got something that relates source and target contexts, how would we do it to a term? Um, well, we need to, wh wh where's the difference between these two things? There's a little bit of a difference in how it acts on the variables, and we've got to explain how to cope when we go under a lambda. Absolutely everything else is the same. So I'm probably not going to finish the job here. But it's how do you act on a variable? So that's to say, um, we're all S, S's, T's, if you have an M from S's to T's, you need to know how you turn a var S's S into a term T's S. <coughs> and you also need to know when you go under a binder, how you stick. Oh, that should be, what do I, oh, that's, that's LM. And that should be the case. Okay, so if we have that, we ought to be able to write the joy of cut and paste, I'll have it done before the end of this lecture. to do. So preserve the structure of the term. When you get to the variable, do the variable thing. When you go under a lambda, modify the morphism by what's this? This is saying basically that uh, there has to be a functor uh, that uh, transforms morphisms to, to morphisms. So the challenge then is to uh, show that uh, thinning uh, uh, is indeed an action. So you have to say, what does it do on variables? Well, we get the thinning and we get the variable and it gives us back bar x composed with the thinning. And what does it do to go under a binder? Os. I should call this all caps thing. substitution do to a variable? Uh, well, we get a bunch of t's and we get an x. And now I'm going on the steel. And then what's 
this. That should be exactly however many brackets I need. What's it complaining about? Um, oh, I uh, didn't need that sub extra subs. saying is uh, how to act on a variable and what you need to do to cope when a lambda brings an extra variable into scope. And um, okay, I've still used thin here, but I could instead use uh, act dot act thin. What? Uh, action dot act. This way, by just abstracting out which category of morphisms is acting on terms and writing all the boring stuff of just piling through the ordinary constructors uh, of the syntax uh, systematically. Uh, we boiled it down to how do we cope with variable binding and what do we do when we reach a variable. And then we instantiate the same program twice, once for thinning, and that gives us the ability to do the right thing uh, once for substitution. Naturally, of course, we ought to prove that thinnings form a category and that they act functorially on terms. That's to say, if you apply the, uh, if you thin a term with the empty thin, or with the identity thinning, it won't do anything to the term. And if you uh, thin a term with a composition of thinnings, uh, you, uh, it's like thinning with the first one, then thinning again with the second one. And the same thing for substitutions. There's an identity substitution, which maps all of the variables to themselves. And uh, there's composition of substitutions. Uh, so what does composition of substitutions do? Well, a substitution is just a bunch of terms. So you do the second substitution to all of the terms in the first substitution, and you've got a composed substitution. And again, you would expect that the action of a, compo a composition of substitutions is the composition of the actions. Uh, so uh, what we have finishing off is just that, uh, you know, once again, the categorical structure of what's going on, seeing things not just as a type here, uh, a function there, but as really giving us some structure, collecting things, uh, uh, you know, collecting, re relating things as, as functors, you know, gives us uh, the, the tools we need uh, to, get, uh, to get work done in a sensible compositional way. So at that point, uh, I'd, uh, I'd better stop and say, thanks very much. It's been lots of fun, cheerio internet land, uh, and uh, Merry Christmas.